Well, it is a great, great week for the fair. The weather has been amazing. Hopefully it will hold for us. But for our purposes today, I might want my message with me. <clears throat> We're going to take our Bibles and let's go over to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. And as you go there, I want to direct your attention to chapter 10. If you've been uh, exposed to the Romans road, you're familiar with this chapter as it is the crescendo of the presentation of the gospel. It is in this chapter that we have two of those verses that help us know that it is with certainty uh, we may be saved. Many people live on that cusp of uh, indecision or undecidedness, uh, indecisiveness, not knowing uh, whether they're saved or not, whether they're saved or lost, they just, you know, they've prayed, they've done whatever, but they just for some reason can't find their way to be confident and secure in the Lord. The Lord would have us to be secure. We sang the song this morning, My Anchor Holds. Well, for our purpose today, our anchor needs to be holding. And we need to remember that there is a word of faith, for that is the t uh, title of the message. The word of faith is set forth in the book of Romans and chapter 10. But as I take you to chapter 10, we're coming in for a landing in the middle of a book, so I have to tell you what's been contextually going before. You see, Paul is writing to the Roman church, and not Romanism as we know it today, for it did not exist at this point. It did not come into existence until about 300 A.D. as we see it today. But this is the church in Rome, the true church in Rome. And it was made up of two groups of people, and it created quite a stir. You see, there were those Jewish people, and there were those Gentile believers as well, and they would come together somehow trying to figure out how to get along. The problem was is that there were those in the midst of the Jewish community that were coming to faith in Christ who had a problem with these Gentiles. They felt that they were above them in some way. As the church age winds down, I think we have a concern also that maybe sometimes we as those who love Jesus, know Jesus, and own copies of the scriptures, read them routinely, somehow think we're better than the world. We have to be careful about that. So lean in with regard to that. But what Paul does early on in the first three chapters is he teaches them that uh, they as Jewish, he teaches those Jewish members of that community there, that they not only were more culpable oftentimes, but more alienated than their Gentile counterparts. And so as he goes through, he's constantly trying to get them to see themselves in the mirror of God's Word. That in fact, the law was written to those who were under the law. <laughs> because the law was written to the Jews. The Jews had the law. They were more culpable for they had it and they dismissed it. They had it and they disobeyed it. And so as he comes through, he makes his case. He talks about how salvation came before circumcision. They would glory in their, in their, in their surgic, surgeries uh, that they had as a result of being Jewish. But he said Abraham wasn't circumcised. He came to faith. David says there's a blessedness to one uh, who has uh, been given the privilege of not having their sin imputed to them. And there's a blessedness. He is trying to bring them back to clarity. As we enter into this week where we go to the fair and we spend day after day after day trying to bring people around, maybe showing them the gospel through a beaded bracelet that is a wordless bracelet, it shows the gospel very simply. We go there, but we go there with a heart that understands that people need the Lord. Paul, knowing that the Israelites were a mess, says in chapter 10 and verse 1, he says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. As much as he felt as though they were culpable and alienated, he still had a heart for them. Do you realize that when people come into the circle of our lives, that they're coming with a lot of wounds? That really, as you go through day-to-day -day life, what you're seeing is a debris field of people who have been battered. I'm reminded of a story of a young boy who grew up and became a pirate. After decades of being at sea, he comes back to his hometown and he runs into his childhood minister. And his minister knew him as Billy Boy. And he said, Billy Boy... 
Is that you? Yes, yes it is, preacher. Hey, what happened to you? You look a mess. He says, oh, I'm fine, what do you mean? He said, well, how about that, that leg to start off with? You've got a peg leg. Oh, I lost that leg with a cannonball one day. But I'm fine, really, I'm fine. Oh, but Billy, Billy, what about that hook on your hand, where your hand used to be? Ah, oh, that. I was in a fight one day. And as I was in that fight, the man I was fighting took my hand off. But I bettered him in the end. And I won that battle. But I, and I'm fine. It's been a while. I'm used to it. Well, what about that patch on your eye? Well, now that's another story. A big flock of birds was flying over one day. And as they flew over, I looked up and a huge group of them went by and the bird droppings fell right in my eye. He said, wow. He said, you can't lose an eye from bird droppings. He said, yeah, but that was the day after I got my hook. <laughs> so, you know the people, the people that you meet. They're coming with a peg leg and a blind eye and a lost hand, and they're coming to you, and they're saying, I'm fine, really. Really, I'm fine. I'm telling you guys, we need to have the compassion of Jesus. That's hard. I'm like Jonah. I want to run the other way. I got to shake this broke. I want to run the other way. I don't want to deal with the nasty and the mess. In my Sunday school class, we talked about some of the things that I ran across this past week in my reading that just makes the hair stand off, uh, up in the back of your neck. Stuff that goes back to Leviticus chapter 18. Everything that is nasty listed in Leviticus chapter 18. It's happening around you and me today. Our children are subjected to it and the land is threatening to vomit us out. But before it does, we can rescue a few. We can help some. Paul said, my heart's desire in prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. My heart's desire today is that America and Americans might be saved. They're a mess out there. They don't realize it. They'd say, oh, I'm fine. They'd say nothing's wrong. They'd deny, they'd deny, they'd deny. But the fact is, is that there is a word for them. And when Paul is talking about the righteousness that God would have people to know about, he doesn't refer them to that which Jesus mentions in chapter 5 of the book of Matthew, where it says, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you cannot enter into heaven. Certainly it is kind of cryptically there, seated there. But Jesus was trying to get those folks lost. And for you and for me, we understand that the righteousness which God talks about is in verse 6. It says, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on a specific way, in a specific way. And if you let your eye fall into it, because he first tells you what it doesn't say, he says in verse 8, he says this word of faith is this, verse 9, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, say it with me, say it loud and clear, Thou shalt be saved. Woo! I'm telling you what! I want to be saved! And because I have God's promise, I know that I am. And when you come down to verse 13, he says it in a more abridged fashion. If whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Beloved, what I'm trying to show us as we do our run-up to the real heart of this message is that there is a lot of debris in the world. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 6 that such were some of you. But now you are washed. Now you are cleansed. The immorality of your teen years, of your youth, such were some of you. We can't be the Jewish people looking down our noses and saying, these Gentiles, these wicked people, we have to look in the mirror and say, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. We do get it on us, don't we? The things that we 
countenance, the things that we see. We feel like what we used to wonder about. We feel what we used to wonder about when we would read about Lot, who that just man living in Sodom and Gomorrah vexed his righteous soul as he took in the panorama around him of that world. It says it vexed his soul every day to see the wickedness of Sodom. And you and I are seeing that today. I went to the zoo about, uh, about, a, about a month ago with my wife. And thankfully they let me out. I'm just saying. But I went to the zoo about a month ago and I saw a couple of fellas walking along holding hands. They were good looking fellas as far as manly young men looked like. They, you know, they didn't look troubled, but if you were to ask them, they'd say, I'm fine, Pastor, I'm fine. Were they fine? No, they had a patch and they had a hook and they had a peg leg and they didn't know. And all they knew was that this was part of the life they had chosen. I want to say to you today that when we go to the fair, we're going to see some stuff that will trouble us. But we have to be mindful that God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That we have this treasure of this knowledge in earthen vessels, and that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are perishing. They don't know. They don't know. And they don't know because we don't go. You see, the reality is, is that when we come together, we need to come in here with the idea that I need a big pep talk so I can go back out and win somebody to Jesus. This is not about surviving. This is not about abiding day to day and making it through, you know, circling the wagons, you know, batting down the hatches and saying, let it all go. No, we are secure. Our anchor holds. And we can go and tell somebody. We saw in our study of Colossians in chapter 4 that there was this uh, admonition to stay awake through prayer. That there was this call to let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. That we may be able to give an answer to every man around us. You see, these people are out there. We need to be strategizing, redeeming the time. How can I win them? And if you can't go to the fair, I get that. But you can go somewhere. You'll see somebody who's lost. And what I want you to see is that this is the whole point of chapter 10. As he says that there is this word of faith in verse uh, 8. That's our title because there is a word of faith. The word for word is a word that literally is rhema. It actually has the idea of a flow. It has the idea of a flow. Something that just begins to bubble up and boil over. You know, you get excited about something, you're going to talk about it with enthusiasm. Don't you feel that sometimes about things? Wouldn't you just want to cry out to God and say, God, make me more enthusiastic about Jesus. You know, I've been mindful that I need to use His name more in my day-to-day life. Because they want to use it in a wrong way. I don't want to just say God. I don't just want to say God loves me, God loves you. I want to say Jesus It is, in fact, the sweetest name I know. And so we need to realize, strategizing in our day, how can we make ourselves conspicuous? You know what God did? He took Noah. He said, build me an ark. You're going to be doing it for 120 years. I think that's pretty conspicuous. (laughs) You know? And we're all laying low, man. Don't notice I'm a Christian. You know what? At work, pray over your food. At the restaurant, pray over your food. When you're with your family, pray over your food. If they don't join you, fine. But while you're praying, if you're praying quietly, I tell you what, go after them. God, save Brother Joe. Brother, save my uncle. Save my dad. Save them. Give me words to say. While you're praying, don't just pray for the food. Pray for the wisdom to reach them for Jesus. Beloved, we need to be about the master's business. A guy said to me a couple of months ago, about a month ago, he said, you know, shepherds don't have sheep, sheep have sheep. Now I got sheep. My, my friend Chip was here on Wednesday. Got to win him to Christ while they were marching a statue of Mary down the streets in front of his house. It was noisy and loud. And they all moved in so close so they could pray and ask Jesus to save them. He's open air evangelism today. I wish I had more fruit. I wish I had better fruit. You know, all around us, we need to have a a desire for fruit. 
God's Word says, in, uh, I think it's John 15, that God has ordained you to go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Chip's in the, in the faith today because I'm in the faith today. I can point to a handful. For me, I feel like, you know, I wish there were so many more. And I want so many more. I've had opportunities in recent days to witness to men that it's just been amazing to me how God has, ama- has blessed me in that. But I want to see fruit. Don't you want to see fruit? It's not all about going out and witnessing. Ladies, if you've got kids, you got people you can win to Jesus. Win those kids. Make it your prayer. Pray for them in the morning. Pray for them in the afternoon. Pray for them at night. God, save my children. If you've got grandkids, pray for them. Ladies, go get the grandkids. Go play with them. And love on Jesus and talk about Him fondly. And dads and granddads, you guys have an influence like nobody else has in those kids' lives. You don't have to discipline them. You can take them some candy. You can ram them up with sugar. But while you're doing it, you just sing the praises of Zion and you keep going for Jesus. What I'm saying is strategize. And what he's doing in this passage is he's saying there's some things you need to know about souls being saved. My heart's desire is that they'd be saved. Well, that's a good place for us to start. But if you let your eye fall after he's told us how people can be saved, what you see in verse 14 is something even more uh, to the point. He says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, you, you, you and I, we, we pretty much like to take that word preacher and we like to put it on the pastor. <laughs> but you know, we're all preachers. The word literally means herald. And the word literally has the idea of enthusiasm about what you're talking about. You herald this. You cry in the streets. You, you cry out. If you were to look at Paul being talked to, talking in front of uh, Felix and in front of Agrippa in Acts 26, uh, at one point, Felix says, Paul, you're beside yourself. He says, you're mad. You're losing your senses. He says, I am not mad. Much learning has made you mad. He says, no, I am not insane. He says, I am full of a good matter. I'm talking about eternity. I'm talking about a hope that transcends the grave. I'm talking about that which is great and awesome and true and verifiable. Agrippa goes on as he's sitting next to Felix and he says, Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Paul would have said hallelujah, but the saddest words in the Bible are almost. Because we have no record of Agrippa ever coming to a faith in Jesus. But at least he was trying to what? Persuade them. We know that there is that Ethiopian eunuch who was won to Christ by the evangelist Philip. The Bible says he heard him reading out of the book of Isaiah. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? He said, no, how can I except somebody guide me? How can I except somebody guide me? How can I know this volume, this book, unless somebody guide me? What you know, they don't know. And we need to get it out there, you know. And so he invited Philip up into his chariot as they were on a caravan, and he preached to him Jesus. So we understand preaching is not just the forum of one before many. It's one to one. You preach Jesus, and when you preach it, you preach it in the sense of just telling him how awesome he is to you. I want you to see some things here. I'm going to tell you a couple. I'm going to give you the points ahead of time to give you a feel of where we're going. We're going to see, first of all now, Paul's appeal. Then we're going to see his appraisal. Then we're going to see his acknowledgement in the bigger picture. Then we're going to see an ally, an unlikely ally of Paul's. In verse 14, he says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they've not, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, this passage, this verse specifically, could be understood as a continuum that is laid backwards. The way people get saved is by, first of all, having somebody tell them so they hear, then they believe, and then they call. But you see, he says, how can they call? How can they believe? How can they hear if nobody's going? If nobody's going! If nobody's going! Jesus, in his um, in the Great Commission, said, go... Ye, into all the world, preach the gospel. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you to do. And one of the things He commanded them to do was, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And the Greek word for go is not, uh, it's, it's, it's what is a participle. It's as you are going, preach the gospel. You don't have to go to the mission field. You go to the grocery store. You go to the next door neighbor or the new neighbor who moved in. You go to the person at work. You look for that one. And you try to tell them about Jesus. As you are going, preach the gospel. Talk much about Jesus. And so as we see, what we're seeing here in verse four, uh, 14 is that he's giving an appeal He's basically setting it up in a, in a how, in a how in the world are they ever going to know without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, verse 15, and bring glad tidings of good things. You know, we have glad tidings of good things. Oh, beloved, heaven is going to be awesome. The Bible says that in God's presence is fullness of joy and His right hand are pleasures forevermore. On our brow is going to be everlasting joy. The Bible tells us that eye hath not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. It's going to be good. I want you to know the payoff because sometimes you have to, you know, stiffen your uh, upper lip and you need to kind of just muscle down and head down and go through like in a football game. You know, you're going to try to get through the line and life's going to be hard, but I want you to know just yonder, it's going to be good. Don't ever lose the blessed hope of the fact of His glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He who will come shall come and He will not tarry. I want you to know we're going to begin a study in the book of Revelation soon. I haven't done it in the main services for a long time. We're going to preach through that again. Why? Because I think Jesus is coming and I'm hoping I'm not going to get through it. <laughs> I get about so far and we'll get to the first, chap first verse of chapter 4 and it'll say, come up hither and we'll just go. <laughs> Let's do that, okay? You've got to be here for that and tell somebody. But you see, you understand, don't you? He says that we need to be sent. And then he says, you know... Understand how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. And you have to understand the word beautiful here actually has the idea of how seasonable, how perfect in its timing. You ever have perfect timing? I drove up to Cleveland about a week or two ago, and I drove back, and I had to stop in at the UPS to pick a thing up over there. When I came back, my car wouldn't start. My battery had died. It could have died in Cleveland. But it died at right the perfect place. I'm a mile away from home. My wife came over with my jumper box and we started my car. How beautiful that is. I was encouraged that God had my back. Because I could have been anywhere from here to there. But I was home. I was within the sight of home, really, uh, potentially. Beloved, what I'm saying to you, how beautiful, how seasonable, how perfect in timing that you're here. That you know Jesus. That there are people who don't and you do. And how beautiful are your feet. How timely, how perfect, how seasonable, how, uh, how perfect and flourishing. That's what it means to have beautiful feet. And Paul says, this is something I'm appealing to you to do. You need to go. You need to tell. You need to stop, as it were, in the context of the, uh, the Jews and the Gentiles. Stop looking at each other and, you know, examining each other. Look at the world. I'm worried about Israel. They all need to be saved, but they need to be saved properly, right? <laughs> they don't need to be saved to contention, criticism, and criticalness. They need to be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Just like the Gentiles. Just like you. Everybody gets in on the same uh, with the same word of faith. The word of what? The word of faith. That if you will call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. The word is in your mouth, he said. You guys have been saying it for centuries. The just shall live by faith. They knew this. He has shown you, old man, Micah 6, 8 says. He has shown you what is good. And what is it that the word of the Lord doth require of you but to live justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? It's not about the rites and the Sabbaths and the, and the feast days and all of these things. It's about loving God. 
And it's a word of faith. Every time you took a sacrifice, he would say, you were saying it should be me. You were supposed to be saying that. But no, what you might have been saying if you were a Jew is you might have been saying, look, I brought a sacrifice. Where's everybody else? (laughs) Oh, it should have been me. Those were my nails. That was my crown. Those were my tears that flowed down. You see, humbleness is part of it. Humility is important. He appeals to them. How can they go? Know that you can have beautiful feet. Know that they can be timely. That your boots on the ground. After he makes his appeal, he gives a little bit of an assessment. He says, but, in verse 16, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Now the word for obeyed here is hupakuo. It means to hear under. And he's talking about the Jews properly because he says, they, referring back to verse 1, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, but they have not obeyed the gospel. It is my contention today that many in the church do not obey the gospel. And what it means by obeying, it means to be under it, under it, under it. To listen to it as a subject of it. You are a subject subject of the kingdom of God. Christ is our king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He says, if you call me Lord, why do you not do the things I say? The king has given his call. Go ye. What is he commanded? Go ye. Be ye holy as I am holy. These are basics. They're not made to make us bristle. He doesn't make those commandments to make us bristle. He gives us those commandments to help us be better. You are made better by loving God. You are made better by telling people about Jesus. One of the most neat things in the world is when somebody grabs you by the arm and says, you know, I was thinking about this, and the next thing you know, you're having a conversation about Jesus. It's the most neat thing in the world. You don't have to wait for that. If you wait for that, it will only come in between times far and few between. But if you go with a strategy, if you redeem the time, if you try to figure out ways to get your gospel down so you can share it when God gives the opportunity. God will give the opportunity. Somebody said one of the greatest abilities in the Christian faith is the, uh, is the ability of availability. <laughs> Are you available? Are you prepared? Because each one of us has to prepare ourselves. I will not be there when somebody asks you a question about Jesus. If somebody talks about the nonsense that the world keeps throwing out there and you know a chapter and a verse, somebody talks about being in hell. I heard a guy say one day, he said, hey, he said, uh, said, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I'll be in a furnace over here and I'll see you on hell. I said, well, Job 27 says it's not going to be a party. And I just threw that out there, just putting a little word in their mind. Job 27. Beloved, there are many ways that you can prepare yourself. One of them is right now. You come, you say, oh yeah, I get it, I get it. But may I say, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He's talking to these people and he says, they have not listened under the gospel. They have not subjected themselves, in essence, to the gospel. Have we subjected ourselves? That's the question, isn't it? Because, see, as they were... We in the church age now, coming down to the end, kind of are. We would rather look down at the world around us rather than look out to the world around us. That's a hard thing to word look out, isn't it? It's a nasty business out there. I reference for you again Leviticus 18. It's all going on out there. You might scribble that down and read it later. It's all out there right now. It's what vomited the people out of, out of Canaan. It's what caused them to be vomited out. We're on the cusp of it. He says, but they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, uh, said, uh, for Isaiah saith the Lord, uh, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So he says, they have not obeyed because they haven't heard. He says, some have heard, but they've not believed. And he says, hearing, they need to hear more about the, the Lord. You know, We're living in very amazing times. I just want to say, this world is like a volcano right now. I'm so glad my anchor holds. I'm so glad I know what I know, because if I didn't know what I know, when I needed to know it, I wouldn't know it, and then where would I be? (laughs) It's easy to buckle when you don't know, when you're not convinced. 
If you're not convinced that through door number one back in the day of Monty Hall, you're going to win, man, there's trepidation and fear. You might say, I'll just keep the $50 in my hand. Many people walked away in the days of persecutions because they didn't know that they knew. John says, these things have I written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. If you don't know it, you're not going to stand when the press comes. You're not going to stand up when everybody else is kneeling down. You're going to bail. You're going to walk away. You're going to find a hole and crawl in it. You're going to say, I'm opting out. You're going to excuse yourself. When God would say you need to input input yourself, introduce yourself. What I'm saying is, is that these people didn't obey. He says because they, the reason they didn't obey was because they didn't believe. They didn't listen under because they really didn't believe. Can you imagine that? It's kind of like we like to pick on them, right? Right? We like to pick on them. Man, there's manna every morning. You don't believe? What? (laughs) What? Red Sea parted. You don't believe? What? Listen, Jesus died. And he was buried. And he rose again. And we're still wondering about the details? (laughs) Well, I don't know. I don't know. Wait a minute. We also have the Red Sea. (laughs) Because we can go back and see stuff that shows us it happened. We still have the flood, the seashells on top of Mount Everest and all these mountains. We still have evidence that they had. And we're still sitting here, well, I don't know if it's really important that I go because, you know, I don't know that I believe. Why don't I go? It's because I don't believe. Listen, we need to believe. And if we don't believe, we need to get our questions answered. And once we get our questions answered, we need to become convinced. And once we're convinced, we will have conviction. And when we have conviction, we'll begin to have some conversations. Because we got our questions answered. You know, we live in a day of Googling, right? YouTube. If I fix something on my car, I need to fix it. I go to YouTube. Man, I got all the information I need. I can change my bearings and my front wheels. I can take my my engine and I can put this in. I can see what tools I need before I ever get started because I got YouTube. And what I'm saying is, is that we think we're pretty smart because we got these things. There's ways to answer the questions you have in the back of your mind. But the questions you answer, you're going to go tell somebody about You know, you can fix that easy. I found a thing on YouTube. Go look at it. Listen, you can tell people you can fix that that problem you got with your hook. (laughs) You can avoid the hook. You can avoid the peg leg. You can avoid the poked out eye. You can avoid it. Why? How? By taking heed thereto according to his word. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed. Because God says, come to me. In my Sunday school class, we were talking about how the Lord said to the people... You will not do like those in Egypt. You will not do like those in the land of Canaan. And then he catalogs what they did. And it sounds like, well, well, you know, God's so mean. He's telling me I can't do it. He says, and, and I tried to bring home to our hearts that it's not about his prohibitions. It's his protection. He's saying, basically, put the blinders on. Don't look at Egypt. Don't look at Canaan. Look at me. Don't do what they're doing. Come to me. It'll be okay. I got gotcha. Sometimes your children may have jumped into daddy's arms and he caught them. And that was a time where they had faith that daddy would catch them. Beloved, what I'm saying is is that he's making his assessment of things and he's saying they didn't believe. Because they didn't believe, they didn't obey in verse 16. He says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The reason they didn't believe and the reason they didn't obey was because they didn't have much faith. They weren't listening Jesus said of this of this issue, he said, take heed how you hear. Take heed. You know, a lot of people hear poorly. They hear and they veer. <laughs> they hear and they, well, I got a question. We're going to see that at the end of the chapter. But we need to hear. He says, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I'm so thankful that I get to read it and study it and peruse it. And as the years have gone by, I've understood it more and better. And I just I just sit back and have a little party. <laughs> with Jesus because it's so good. It's so good. There's nothing like being in the room and having insight nobody else has. You know, these people are nuts, man. Look at them. They're crazy. They don't even have a clue. But I do. And if you can sit there with your little song, you know, singing and making melody in your heart under the Lord, they're going to look at you and say, what in the world's wrong with you? (laughs) You're going to say, nothing, man. I'm, I'm good. I am really good. Well, why are you good? Nobody else is good. I'm good because God is good. You see, nobody can have that for you. Nobody. 
That's why it's a personal relationship. And there is an end game. There is an agenda. Hearts desire that people would be saved. I need to not be like the Jews of the Old Testament. I need to be a Christian on, on task. Obeying. Believing. Verse 18, he says, Have they not heard? He says, Yes, verily, the sound went out unto all the earth. And it says, Their sound. The word sound here is a very interesting word. The word literally means utterance, uh, or in essence, a musical note. Do you know God made the Israelites a melody in the Old Testament? They were a melody (laughs) to the people who watched them. Man, they had their they had their motions that they went through. They were walking the line. They would do the sacrifices. They would have the, the Passover. They would, they would have their Levitical cities. They had their laws and they had their ways and they had their protections all in place. Everything about it was phenomenal. The more you heard it, the more it danced around their hearts. Why? Well, things like this. The circumcision on the eighth day. The eighth day is when the vitamin K in the body is so high that it fights infection. If eighth day, a child could be circumcised without as much a cause or per fear of being infected. Did they know? No, I don't need to tell you everything. God says, just do it my way. It'll be okay. Yeah. Stuff like that's cool. They say, what are you doing? We're listening to God. Why are you trading on the Sabbath day? Well, God said on six days, He created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, He rested. So we just want to remind you, God created all this. Everything about it was musical. Everything about it was an utterance. They, the, the sound, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Again, the word is rhema. Their words, they were pouring forth because everybody in the nation was on the same page. On the Sabbath, they would talk and they would commemorate and they would ask questions. Why is it? At the Sabbath, they'd say, why did this happen? And it became, they would tell them all about how God delivered them uh, from Egyptian bondage. How they took a lamb and how they put blood on the door and they put it on the top and they put it on both sides and they said, wow, that's weird. Yeah, just hang on. It'll come in clearly. It was a shadow of a cross. Top, sides, blood dripping down in the middle. A cross. Their utterance, their words, they poured forth everything they did. The Bible says of the priests in the book of, I think it's Zechariah, he says, uh, Zechariah, these are men to be wondered at. Everything about you is to be wondered at. Everything about you. We are now the priests. The Bible says he has, he has called you and made you to be a kingdom of priests. You are a peculiar people. Uh, priests unto our God, Peter tells us. And what we see is he says their sound went out, the musicalness of it all, the, the melodious, melodious kind of uh, activities that they put before people, their words went unto the end of the earth. But, again, I say, did Israel not know? <laughs> he said, first Moses said unto them, I will provoke you to jealousy with another people. He says, in a foolish nation, and I will anger you. The word for foolish is interesting because now he's beginning to turn this tide to the fact of these Gentiles were significant in God's program. He says, you know, my assessment has been that you have missed the, missed the boat. You've not believed. You've not believed. You've not had faith. You've not obeyed because you haven't had faith. He says, but I tell you, Moses already said it way back in the beginning. I'm going to provoke you. I'm going to make you angry with a people, a, a foolish, a nation. The word foolish is an interesting word. It's not the word we get moron from. There's a word morane, uh, not morane, but it's moron in the, in the sense. And it means to be sluggish and stupid and not having uh, wherewithal to think. But this word literally means to be without intelligence, without the ability to put things together. Uh, it means to, be, uh, not, to not have any sagacity, which means wisdom. They just didn't have it. You see, the Gentiles who came to faith in Christ came to faith very, very quickly when the gospel doors were kicked open. You remember the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's all he told him. And he took them out and washed their wounds and he preached Jesus to the rest of the family. Everybody got saved. It was a good day. He didn't have to get all technical. You know, some of us are sitting back saying, man, I don't know, man. Is it superlapsarianism or infralapsarianism? What is it? You guys are saying, what is it? I know, right? <laughs> Dark ages, how many angels can dance on a pen? What? Who cares? Go tell somebody about Jesus. Uh, you see, reality is, is we're not down here for nothing. 
You know, this is a sad day we live in because people think it's all about self, and it's not. We're not here for nothing. God has a plan, and He provokes with a foolish nation. We've all heard the story about somebody getting saved, coming into the church, and the next thing you know, all the old-timers are saying, well, yeah, he'll get over it. <laughs> God forbid! But we think, they'll get over it. And fact is, is that sadly, many do. They find their place in the pew, they get on the train, and they begin to mosey along rather than go out like they once wanted to and win somebody to Jesus. When you heard, didn't you want your mom to know, your dad to know? Didn't you want your brother and sister to know? Didn't you want your kids to know? Wasn't there something in there that set a fire ablaze in your heart? What is going on with that right now? Is it still flaming? I hope so. God would have it so. It was Jeremiah who said it this way. I said, I will not speak anymore in his name. I will be silent and I will fold my arms. I'll even eat my own flesh. He said, but hey, when I was silent, my bones of fire burned within me. Paul said, woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel. The gospel of Christ constrains me. How good is the gospel to you and to me? We have to be people who understand that it is the answer to every question. To the peg leg, to the hook arm, to the blank eye. It is the answer. It makes sense of it all. He says they, they would be provoked to jealousy by a foolish nature, a nation. Uh, and he says, and by that foolish nation, I will anger you. And, you know, it's funny because envy and, 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 and anger, they go together, don't they? It makes me so mad they got that. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Uh, do you know what you got? You got just what God wants you to have. Isn't that true? You got what God wants you to have. He's let you have it. He could have said no, but he let you have it. You got more than you ever could have wanted. You got more than you ever could have asked for. But after a while, you know, it's kind of funny because the spirit of the age is, they should give me more. <laughs> That's where always, man, well, I, should, I should have some more. Isaiah is very bold in verse 20. He says, he said, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. That goes, there's another verse for your seeker sensitivity. The Bible says in chapter 3, there is none that seeketh after God. He said, I was found of them that sought me not. You know what? When somebody brings the gospel to somebody who's not seeking him, you might find somebody who's just ready to get saved. Oh, that makes sense. You ever seen somebody sitting there just not figuring something out? You're like walking up, oh no, all you got to do is turn it this way, like a, a lock or maybe it's just some little thing. All you got to do, oh, thanks. I just uh, Or they're looking for their keys and you see them behind them. You know, you, what, a, what a relief. What a relief. People are out there and they're walking back into their worlds uh, 30 years down the road. Oh, hi, Pastor. Hi, Minister. How you doing, Reverend? Good, Billy. What's wrong? What happened to you? Oh, I'm fine. Ah, oh, you're not fine. You need Jesus. <laughs> you might lose another eye. You might lose another limb. You might lose another hand. Listen, God can spare. You a world of hurt. And the earlier you get on the gospel train, the better you will be served. There is a place of quiet rest. It's near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest. It's near to the heart of God. We can't muscle our way through this. We need the Lord and we need to let other people know that we need the Lord. Rather than going in superior, we need to go in subjugated to God and saying, you know what, I got nothing. When they say, man, my life's a wreck, you say, man, mine was too. I've got, you know, my own struggles. Wow, yeah. You do? You're a Christian. I thought you don't have struggles. <laughs> Devil paints it, paints it that way, doesn't he? We got struggles. He said, I was found, verse 20, by them that sought me not. And he said, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. These two verses basically put before us not only um, his uh, assessment, but his acknowledgement. You see, Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he said, you know what? Concerning law, I was blameless. He said, I could have boasted in the flesh. But what he ends up doing is he realizes the Gentiles were the ones that were open to the God he loved. 
It's funny because there's stories that abound of people getting saved that, that had all of the grave garments still on. You're coming out of the graveyard, being raised from the dead, got all the grave clothes. It was me. When I first got saved, long hair, didn't know when to say amen at the right time. You know, the preacher would be up there, he'd be preaching, he said, he'd say something about, you know, uh, you know, God is gonna, God is gonna be, you know, good, and God is gonna do the right thing, and I wouldn't say amen at that point. He'd say, you know, uh, and, and I failed this week, and I'd say amen. And, Wait a minute, he said he failed, you're not supposed to say amen at that time. My point is, I didn't know when to cuss at the right time when I was a kid, and I didn't know when to say amen or at the right time when I got saved. Listen, it's all learning. You remember as a kid, don't you, trying to try and your cuss on? When was the last time you said amen at the right time? We need to want to say amen. We need to want to be the guy who has the Lord look of Jesus all over him and the love of Jesus all over him. I can't do that for you. I, I, I've seen preachers, uh, you know, mimicking that or kind of making a caricature of it. They'd preach, they'd run down and sit on the front pew and say, Amen, and run back up. <laughs> Nobody else did. Guys, listen, it's so good to know Jesus. And he says, what I found is I found that those Gentiles that you despise, you think you're more, you're, you're better than they are. He says, you're more culpable and you're more alienated than they are because I'm found, he's found by those who are, uh, who are the furthest away. They weren't even seeking me. These are people who were foolish. They didn't have any intelligence to put brick to brick. But when they heard it, they asked not after me, but when they heard it, they got saved. And I want you to know that that's a good possibility and we need to remember God's at work in the machinery of every person's life. His Spirit's in the world reproving the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And some will be almost persuaded and not persuaded, but we still persuade and Paul's not laying down and saying, oh, I'm, you know, I believe it's all predestined. No, Paul didn't believe that. If you kept reading and you studied it, you'd find out that's nonsense the way people just go with the next chapters. What he's saying is, my heart's desire is this, and they need to hear, and when they hear, they might just get saved. He didn't say God ordained some to go to hell. Verse 21, he says, but to Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and a gainsaying people. Same word back there a minute ago about disobeying. They have not obeyed. It means to hear under. They've been a people who would refuse to hear under. They wouldn't get under God's word and say, God's word says this, I'm going to do it. It's probably a pretty good uh, paradigm to live life by. God's word said, I'm going to do it. And then he says, they're again saying people. And that means that they are a people who literally just turn the things and twist the things in a way that is not in keeping with what it means. The word is antilego. It means that they dispute, they refuse, they contradict, they deny, they gainsay. The reason people contradict is because it, it maybe helps them maintain whatever course they're on. If God says do this and we say no, many times it's because we have decided we're going to do it our way and so we'll argue the case on other fronts. I want you to take your Bibles and go over to Hosea chapter 14. Would you do that? For this is Paul's unlikely ally. Paul said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But he says, confess. He says, Whosoever shall call. And there's a little bit of a question about whether people should be led in prayer about their salvation. The Bible says uh, in Isaiah, uh, Hosea in chapter 14, it's going to be hard for some of us to find because it's kind of hidden there. But you'll find it. Just keep looking. Chapter 14. And if you want a little heads up, if you see uh, the book of Joel, you'll be right in front of, it'll be right in front of the book of Joel. Just fan there and find it. Chapter 14 says, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Now this is an unlikely ally, but it is an ally we need to know because he's talking to Israel. Israel has fallen badly. I believe the church in the modern day has fallen badly. Do you know the world in which we live make us look so good, we don't try to do any more good than we're already doing. <laughs> Isn't that true? I think we look pretty good compared to the world, but the fact is, is that doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's not he that commends himself, but whom the Lord commends that's really to be commended. 
And what we have to do is we have to see this for what it is. As Israel was, we are today. And he would say, O church, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord and say unto him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. Now what I want to do here is I want to punctuate something very important. He's talking about a people who thought they were saved, but were not saved. <laughs> These are people who not, as a nation, needed to return to God, but many of them were not real Israelites. The Bible says not all in Israel are of Israel. You know, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob getting the name Israel. He had faith. He wrestled with God. I won't let you go lest you bless me. And God and Abraham brought forth this young boy. He, he, knew, about his, his, he knew about his God uh, by Abraham. And, he, and Abraham was, you know, he was also a man who, who believed God. It was imputed to him for righteousness. He saw how faith worked. And every Israelite who really saw how faith worked was saved when they trusted in God, Yahweh, God, to be the one who would take away all sin. They could see beyond the sacrifice. Abraham, it is said, of Jesus mentioned, he said, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced to see it. When they could see through the sacrifice as a shadow to that which one day would have to be substance because it was not possible that the blood of goats and bulls and so forth could take away sin. They could just cover it for a while. Jesus was the Lamb of God. He cleanses us from sin. What am I talking to you about? I'm talking to you about the word of faith. It finds its moorings at the cross. And we let go of this world and we say, Christ, only Christ. Nothing in my hands I bring, only to the cross I claim. That's what we declare. And that is faith. I can't get there by my works. It's not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians says. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves, as Paul tells Titus. Beloved, here are they are hearing the same truth. What does he say? He says, here's the prayer. I want you to pray. He says, take with you words. He says, and return to the Lord. He says, say to him, take away all iniquity. That sounds like, forgive me of my sin. That's a prayer that is, you know, it's, it's transgenerational. It's eternal. Take away our iniquity. Receive us graciously. That's all we get is great. We need grace. I need grace. You know what grace is? It's scary. Grace is not getting what you deserve. If you get justice, you get what you deserve. If we got justice, we'd all go to hell. If we got mercy, we wouldn't get what we deserve. That doesn't kind of get us in the room yet, but at least we're not going to be blown out of into a, blown into a bit oblivion in a moment that we raised our puny little fist and turned our back on God. But we get mercy, so He tarries. But that's not getting us in. That's just mercy. He said, I'm not going to hit you every time. But grace, that's another thing. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Grace is God putting you as a son, placing you as a saint, making you holy, imputing to you righteousness where you don't deserve it. Uh, Romans chapter 4 talks about the blessedness of the man, listen to this, to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. I want to be that guy. That's a blessing. That's a guy you need to watch. What's that guy got going on? He knows God will not impute to him iniquity. Not only that, he says, receive us grac graciously. And this is where we sometimes fumble the ball. So will we render the calves of our lips. You know what that is? We're going to brag on Jesus. We're going to brag on God. My salvation sets me free to say what I believe. There were songs I wouldn't sing. That unicorn song as a child, that little unicorn song. I wouldn't sing it after I got to a certain age because the kids around me would make fun of me. But I'll sing it today, man. Cats and rats and elephants, which are as you're born, the loveliest of them all was the unicorn. I love that song because it talked about Noah. In my little heart as a child, I identified with God seeing some sinning, and it gave him pain. And he said, stand back. I'm going to make it rain. Hey, Brother Noah, i tell you what you do. Build me a floating zoo. That spoke to a boy's heart. And when I got saved, I could sing that song again. 
And I get goosebumps telling you about it because I became me again. I got real again. God brought me into the light. And he said, this is something you can brag on. I want to brag on Jesus. I want him to have a sacrifice of praise. The calves of my lips. It's a praise. It's a sacrifice. You and I are called upon in Hebrews, I think it's 13 or 12. He says, uh, render the sacrifice of praise. And it is a sacrifice because all the world is saying Jesus in a swear word. And you're saying it with love and devotion. And you're going to look like you're walking out of step. You say it anyway. You say it again. And don't say it with malice. Say it with love and tears. Say, I am sighing and crying over what people think of Jesus. Because He is the best thing this world has ever seen. He in the world was so wicked and so foul and so broken that it couldn't stand Him. So they nailed Him to a cross. That's how broken this world is. And this ally we find for Paul here is saying, take words, call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Take words with you. Take away all iniquity, Lord. Take away my perversities. Take away my propensities. Take away what is upon me every day. This, this guilt and this shame and this, this, this hatred that's in my heart and this foulness that's in my soul. Paul himself said, I would not have known lust had it said, thou shalt not covet. You know, the world doesn't know lust because they don't know it says thou shalt not covet. They don't know they're lusting. They're just living the way they think they should. They're applauding it. They're going way of all flesh. Verse 14 says, or verse 3 of chapter 14 says, we will not trust Asher to save us. We're not going to trust horses. We're not going to look anymore to the work of our hands and say, you are our gods. He says, uh, because it is in thee that the fatherless finds mercy. God interjects, I will heal their backsliding when they pray. Now, I'm, I'm dancing on a little bit of an edge here because Israel, much, many of them were lost. Many in the church today think they're saved. The Bible says in, Hebrew, in, in, in Matthew chapter, four, uh, chapter 7, many shall come in that day and say, Lord, Lord, uh, have we not done many things in your name? And he'll say, I never knew you. I never knew you. I never knew you. Let us not deceive ourselves. We need to say, am I really in it? Have I really got it? Do I really understand it? Have I put brick to brick? Do I understand? It's all about Jesus and that he is the Savior. Not me. Not what I've done. Not where I've been. Not my list. It's Christ. He says, we're not going to trust in horses. We're not going to trust in our nation. We're not going to trust in the work of our hands, which many people trust their good works. He says, no, it is in thee that the fatherless finds mercy. He says, I'm going to heal them. He says, I'm going to love them freely. The word love means to actually fondle them. He's going to like stroke their hair. He's going to hold them close. He's going to, he's going to just love on them. It's close. He will be for you what you need. When you're lonely, you're not alone if you're his child. He says, I will love them freely. He says, I will be as the dew unto Israel, verse 5. Uh, they shall, he, Israel, shall grow as the lily, cast forth roots. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree. And his fragrance, verse uh, 6, shall be as Lebanon. He says, when they follow me, they're going to be beautified. <laughs> Just like we saw beautiful, how beautiful are the feet. Timely, place in the right place, in the right way. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. My yoke is easy, 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 and my burden is light. The word easy literally means serviceable. It's what you were made for. It's what you were created for. Take my yoke upon you. When these guys do that, the Bible says, Ephraim shall say, what if I do... Uh, actually, I want to go back to verse 7. It says, they that dwell under his shadow shall return. Who's that? They that dwell under Israel's shadow. So he's talking about two people. There's the Israel, and then there's they that dwell. They that dwell under the shadow of Israel shall return and revive as the corn and grow as the vine, and the scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do with any more idols? <laughs> Not only are they going to have that, that forgiveness and that mercy, but they're going to have influence and those strangers and aliens in their midst will get saved. You realize we live in the midst of a world gone mad? The inmates are in charge of the asylum today. This country was founded on righteous principles, on the Word of God, with fear of the Holy God who, to whom we must give an account. And today, they're throwing Him out of everything. 
They're dismissing and besmirching, and it's on a, it's like a wave. We're watching a tidal wave build, and it is coming, beloved. We need to rescue a few people before it comes to our door, and we're put in a prison when we're shut down. There are still people, you know this Sheriff Apato or whatever his name was out there in the West where he was this manly guy, 83-year-old sheriff, just doing it right, man. He's up on charges and nobody's even telling the president because he wouldn't stand for it, but he doesn't know. He's so busy. We've got stuff going on under the current. This country's in trouble. Those people we'll see at the fair. Those people in our neighborhoods. Those people in our lives. Those loved ones we say we would die for. They need Christ. That's true. And if we, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that shall perish that are perishing. And this is where he says, what have I to do with idols? Verse 8, he says, Ephraim's going to be so lit up, I don't need that. I wonder what idols we have that would keep us from witnessing. He says, I have heard him. He says, they'll say, what have have I to do with idols? And and the, the quote goes on, I have heard God, and I have observed God, and I am like a green fir tree. For me, from me is thy fruit found. And there's a lot of uh, what we would call uh, pronouns here that are, that are kind of confusing, but it stays the course. Ephraim gets beautified. They begin to interact with it. They say they observe God. Literally, it means to uh, eye Him, uh, to analyze Him, uh, to, to spy out, to lurk for, to care for, to lay wait for. They said, you know, uh, Ephraim's going to say, I'm looking for God everywhere. Now, when you've been restored, when you've been revived as a child of God, you're going to be looking for God. Look for Him. Because you are the one who knows. So many do not know. You're going to be looking for Him. And He says, and he says I've observed Him. The word observed means the idea of going around. A, 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 or actually, the, uh, the word heard is the other word I want to punctuate for you. He says, I've heard Him. It means to eye Him, to take heed to Him, to pay attention to Him, to respond to Him, to begin to speak. It means to sing and to shout and to testify and announce. (laughs) He's saying, listen, I I have heard Him and I, 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 I just want to say something about what I've heard. Look at this, verse 9, closing. He says, who is wise? He will understand these things. Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. And the just shall walk in them. The transgressors shall fall thereby. Now understand something about that last word, transgressors. That word is the same word we would use for apostasy. Apostasy. It means to stand away from the standard. None of us came to Christ with an idea other than what was basically true. If somebody wanted us to Christ, we kind of got it out of the gate. It was sort of a DNA kind of of thing. We knew that we wanted to tell somebody or we felt we wanted to tell somebody. And if we didn't get, you know, patted on the back and congratulated, maybe we got a little persecution, we we, we stepped back. Seed that fell uh, on the stony ground, you know, persecution rose up and they withered. Some of them fell by the thorns and the cares of the world. They were in a mess of a cesspool and, 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 and they were choked. And they live in that neighborhood. But all of us understand, fruit begets fruit. We are the fruit of Christ. He died. He says, except a grain of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abides alone. We need to fall in the ground and die. We need to just say, you know what? I don't get it. I don't understand. I need to get it better and I need to go for God. We need to be a people who understand. We do not want to fall. The word literally means to totter. It means to waver. Falling means to falter or stumble. Faint, fall, means to bereave, means to be cast down, means to be decayed, means to be frail, feeble, ruined, overthrown. And the world is full of Christians on on the highways and byways of life who are all of those things. They may be saved, but they probably don't know it. Second Peter says they forget that they're washed of their sins. They're short sighted unto blindness, forgetting they were washed, so they're not secure. The way you become secure is by interacting with what is true, seeing God show up, making you, becoming due, verse 5, unto you, and making you grow as a lily, making you to have roots that break forth and cast forth and branches. See, salvation is about getting other people saved. God leaves us here so that we'll help other people find Him too.
Would you go this week and take a tract when we leave in a little while and tell somebody about Jesus? Try to find, pray, pray, pray all week long. Just one tract, one person. Pray about it. Who is it God would have you go and say, you know what, I've not told you about this in maybe many years. Or I've never said anything to you about it. You know I'm a church man. You know, keep it simple. You know I'm a church man. You know I'm a, a, a church going lady. And I want to just tell you something I think you really need to know. Because I love you and I know God loves you. Find words. Observe what Jesus did. He identified. And He had compassion. And as we go this week, we need to try to conjure all the compassion, all the words, all the stratagems that we can come up with. Being wise as serpents, harmless as doves, trying to woo them from the abyss of destruction. Would you bow with me? I don't know where you are today, but I know that God has a plan for each one of us that we are to be involved and engaged in. Perhaps today you would say, Pat.